The Haunting. Loud and special effects heavy ghost movie about an experiment in fear gone wrong. Liam Neeson plays Dr. David Marrow, who wants to study the effects of fear, by inviting guests to stay in a really spooky old mansion. Only the guests think that they are there to help with their insomnia issues. One of these guests include Eleanor, aka Nell, played by Lily Taylor, who is going through a vulnerable time in life, having spent many years looking after her sick mother who has recently passed away. However, once in Hill House, she starts experiencing terrifying supernatural phenomena. Is this the work of Dr. David Marrow, or is one of the other guests playing a joke? Or do these sinister ghost attacks have something to do with the evil Hugh Crane, who owned the house in the 19th century? The guests eventually discover that they are all in danger of the evil supernatural forces that lurk within the walls of Hill House. Yes, this is one ghost-ridden house that is bound to fill your pants with cake. The question is, would you step inside, or are you too chicken? Well, I ain't no chicken, unlike Chuckstaffer Walken here. So today we're looking into 10 things that you didn't know about the Haunting remake. Let's check it out. Yeah. Number 10, based on a book. So as most people know, the 1999 Haunting is a remake of a 1963 British horror movie also called The Haunting. But that movie itself is a remake. Well, an adaptation anyway. The script for the original Haunting was written by Nelson Gidding, and he based the screenplay on the 1959 book The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. The book is about a Dr. John Montague who wants to do research into the paranormal and rents out the old Hill House for its reputation of being haunted, where he invites guests, all of whom have histories involving the supernatural, where the guests encounter terrifying ghostly happenings, with the main character, Eleanor, getting possessed by the house. Jackson got the idea of writing The Haunting on Hill House after reading about a group of psychic researchers from the 19th century who stayed at a supposed haunted house to see what paranormal findings they could discover. Now this is where things get weird, as The Haunting on Hill House book was the inspiration for the classic horror movie The House on Haunted Hill starring Vincent Price, which also came out in 1959 in which that movie also has the main plot of guests staying at a creepy haunted location to see what events transpire. And that movie got a remake in 1999, the very same year that the Haunting remake was released. So could it be that the house on Haunted Hill and the Haunting are in fact one and the same? Number 9. The original was considered too scary to sit through. So before we got the 1999 Haunting, there was the 1963 original that preceded it. Whereas the 1999 version could be bombastic with its loud noises and overindulgence of CGI, the original was more subtle, generally going for a more suspenseful, spooky atmosphere. Now there are similarities between the two movies. They both focus on a main character called Eleanor, who is part of a group who stay at a supposed haunted mansion. Only unlike the remake, where the guests are tricked into staying at the mansion, thinking that they are working on curing their insomnia, where in reality Dr. Marrow is studying the effects of fear, in the original there are no false pretenses. They are all there researching the rumoured so-called paranormal activity of the place, thanks to many of the people who died tragically in the house, including its sinister owner, Hugh Crane. The original movie definitely had more ambiguity as to whether or not the place is haunted, or if Eleanor is having a mental breakdown, or if someone in the group is pulling a trick on her. The movie was directed by Robert Wise, who would go on to direct West Side Story, along with The Sound of Music, and Star Trek The Motion Picture. And although the original haunting may not be so remembered these days, back in the time of its release, it was considered a really terrifying movie. In fact, it was so well known for people walking out of the movie in fear during its cinematic run, a movie theatre in Houston, Texas held a competition to see who could sit through the movie without leaving any time during the screening. 
and the winner got $100. Hey, that's an easy way to make some coin. But despite its fear factor, the movie didn't make much money during its cinematic run. Probably because people were too scared to go and see it. Number 8. The remake started as a Steven Spielberg and Stephen King collaboration. Yeah, just imagine it. The two great Stevens working together to give us something truly spectacular. So Spielberg approached King in the mid-90s. Although there are some claims that it was King who approached Spielberg, about them both collaborating on a ghost movie together. Now this would have seemed like the perfect ghost story combo, as Spielberg had already written and produced and maybe secretly directed the classic horror ghost movie Poltergeist, and King wrote the classic ghost novel The Shining, and, well, King is the master of horror. What more needs to be said? During the early production of this cinematic horror ghost tale, it was decided to use the 1963 haunting movie as a basis for this film. So the script was in development. But here is where things fall apart. Spielberg wanted the movie to be full of excitement and thrills, a crowd-pleasing roller coaster ride. Basically a Spielberg movie. But King wanted less loud noises and bangs with more of a focus on the horror itself. Basically a King story. So due to the creative differences, the project was abandoned and the script was temporarily shelved. Something that Spielberg and King felt was the right thing to do, despite several years already being put into the development of the script. Hey, I love both Spielberg and King, and I think that they have both given us amazing works over the years. However, maybe the two just aren't meant to work together. Maybe they're just too different. They're both brilliant, but their styles just are too different. Number seven, the project was then split into two. Yes, despite Spielberg and King initially deciding to drop this ghost story script that they had been working on, they both then decided to return to the abandoned script and make their own versions of it. Spielberg approached new coming scriptwriter David Self to rewrite and rework the abandoned script that he and King had been working on. Self is a talented writer whose limited writing credits include the truly brilliant Road to Perdition as well as doing uncredited script work on The Born Identity. So his script would become the basis for the 1999 version of The Haunting. However, King also felt that he wasn't entirely ready to give up on the story either. So in 1999, he bought the rights to the original script that he and Spielberg had been working on. And he reworked the script into the script for his miniseries, Rose Red, which was broadcast in 2002. Which, like the original Haunting on Hill House novel, is about a group of paranormal psychics investigating a notorious old mansion, known for being haunted, to see if they can scientifically have proof of supernatural phenomena. The miniseries got very impressive ratings, and it did get praise, although some did struggle with its overall four hour long duration. In fact, Rose Raid is kind of unique, as it's very rare that King would make a remake of an old story. So if you want to see the Spielberg version of The Haunting, you've got the 1999 movie. And if you want to see the King version, you've got the 2002 Rose Raid miniseries. Which one is better? Well, that's up to the viewer. So could it be that The Haunting and Rose Red are in fact one and the same? Number six, at one stage Wes Craven was going to direct. Yes, believe it or not, but horror movie legend Wes Craven came on board to direct The Haunting. It would have made sense as he was a horror movie legend, thanks to directing The Last House on the Left, The Hills Have Eyes, and above all, the original Nightmare on Elm Street. It was in the early days of production of The Haunting that Craven was contacted by Dimension Films to direct Scream, but he turned the offer down due to his commitments on making The Haunting. However, The Haunting was having a rocky early production, until the production had temporarily collapsed entirely. So needing to find work at the time, Craven contacted Dimension Films and was like, Yeah, you know that haunting movie that I was working on? Well, it didn't really work out. So do you still want me to direct that Scream movie? So I guess it all worked out, as Craven was brought in to direct the horror classic. That brought the slasher genre into the 90s and was a massive success. But that's a story for a previous episode that I made. 
Just imagine had King not left and Craven did direct. You would have had a movie that would have been a collaboration between Spielberg, King and Craven. Now that would have been awesome. Meanwhile, Spielberg was back to square one and needed a director and was about to find him in a very unique place. Number five, Spielberg found the director in a twister. It's here we get to the hauntings director, Dutch filmmaker Jan de Bont who is an impressive filmmaker, especially when it comes to action movies, working as a cinematographer on Die Hard and Basic Instinct, as well as directing the spectacular Keanu Reeves action movie, Speed. In 1996, DeBont also directed the action-packed disaster movie, Twister, which was a Spielberg production. So it was while making Twister that DeBont and Spielberg had become work colleagues. And at this stage, Spielberg was still tied to the haunting. But during the post-production phase of Twister, Spielberg found out that de Bont was going to direct Minority Report, which was based on the Philip K. Dick story. And that was a movie that Spielberg himself really wanted to direct. So he suggested a trade to de Bont. So he basically said, hey, how's about I direct Minority Report? And instead, I got this movie laying about that's not doing anything called The Haunting, so you can direct that instead. At first, de Bont was hesitant, as he didn't want to make a direct remake, so more elements from the original Haunting on Hill House book were brought back into the script, which is probably why the Haunting remake is less subtle and a straight-up horror ghost story. And Spielberg would direct Minority Report, which came out in 2002. Spielberg's newly founded DreamWorks Pictures would produce The Haunting, and apparently Spielberg was a producer on the movie in some capacity, although he is uncredited. Now, according to IMDb, this is because after watching the movie, he really disliked it and wanted to disown himself from it. Number four, filming. The filming for The Haunting mainly took place in England in late 1998. The mansion used as the exterior of the Hill House was Hull Haxton Manor in Lincolnshire, and it was built in 1619. It was used for location filming for several other movies, including the 1973 British comedy, The Ruling Class, and a 2020 version of The Secret Garden. Some of the interior shots of the Hill House were filmed inside the manor's Great Hall. And yep, that hall does look pretty great, so no false advertising here. When it came to filming most of the interiors, the production left England and headed to sunny California, as most of the interior scenes were built on sets inside a dome hangar of all places, which is located in Long Beach, California. The movie had a very impressive cast, including Liam Neeson as Dr. David Marrow, Lily Taylor as Eleanor, Catherine Zeta-Jones as Theo, Owen Wilson as Luke, the irony being Luke is the name of his real-life brother, and oddly, a really tiny appearance by Virginia Madsen as Eleanor's sister, who is briefly shown at the very start, never to be seen again. Number three, reshoots. Yeah, by certain accounts that I've read, making this movie wasn't easy and it wasn't an enjoyable shoot. A huge chunk of the movie supposedly had to be refilmed because during the shoot, its cinematographer, Caleb Deschanel, left the production due to creative differences which caused setbacks. According to IMDb, after watching an early cut of the movie, Steven Spielberg wasn't happy with the movie and requested reshoots to be done. Apparently director Jan de Bont didn't want to return to the reshoots. I guess he felt that he had shot the movie and wanted it to be done and finished with. So more reshoots had to be completed. And I guess this story goes with the theory that Spielberg disowned the haunting because he just simply wasn't happy with the film. Supposedly, de Bont wanted the fear and terror in The Haunting to feel more psychological. But for the reshoots, he was told to put more of a focus on the big loud special effects. Even the ending had to be reshot. Now, I couldn't find any specifics on what the original ending was, but it supposedly had something to do with Eleanor and Crane's standoff. But I'm sure that by the time the reshoots and all the filming was done, Jan de Bont was happy to move on from The Haunting. According to an Entertainment Weekly article, de Bont said that he had to make trims and cuts to the movie in order to avoid an R rating, as the studio wanted kids to be able to go and see the movie. So some scenes that were considered too intense were cut out. So it'd be interesting to see what the R-rated version of The Haunting was like. 
DeBont further added that the haunting is, quote, more surreal. It's not like someone is surprising you with a chainsaw. Incidentally, the movie's trailer features a deleted scene not in the final film, in which Theo and Nell find mysterious doors, and when opened, there is nothing but a brick wall on the other side. Number 2. The Last Spielberg and Jerry Goldsmith Collaboration when it came to composing the spooky music of The Haunting, the legendary Jerry Goldsmith came on board to score the film. He was a frequent collaborator with Spielberg, scoring many Spielberg-produced movies, such as the as-mentioned Poltergeist, Gremlins, Inner Space, and the Twilight Zone movie. As usual, he gives a masterful score, which generally sounds somber and spooky, but also powerful and bombastic when it needs to be. As far as it being a piece of Goldsmith music goes, it sounds familiar and yet different at the same time. It has that romanticised sound that Goldsmith usually injects into his scores, which I absolutely love, especially with Eleanor's theme. But it also has a really dark sense of foreboding too. This might just be one of the creepiest scores that Goldsmith has ever provided. However, he too didn't have the best of times working on The Haunting, as he was just so overwhelmed with work at the time, as he was also scoring The Mummy and The Thirteenth Warrior. The Thirteenth Warrior in particular was really difficult, as he just wasn't happy with the score that he had created for that movie. The Haunting would be the last Spielberg-related project that Goldsmith would work on, and the composing icon passed away five years later. And so, The Haunting kind of marks the end of an era, an era that started with those fun Spielberg movies of the 80s. Number 1. Haunted by Razzie Nominations So The Haunting was released in July 1999, and it was actually quite financially successful, making just over $180 million on an $80 million budget. However, the movie was met with a vast amount of criticism from the critics. It was felt that the movie was a mess that relies too much on horror gimmicks and an over-reliance on CGI, along with a weak script and poor acting. And The Haunting currently has a measly 17% on Rotten Tomatoes. Yep, them tomatoes sure are rotten. To rub salt into the wound, The Haunting would go on to be nominated for a staggering five Razzie Awards, including Worst Picture, Worst Screenplay, Worst Director, and two Worst Actress nominations for Catherine Zeta-Jones and Lily Taylor. However, it lost all of these awards to Wild Wild West. <laughs> Jeez, I sure hope Will Smith didn't slap anyone. It would also go on to be nominated for six Stinkers Bad Movie Awards, and one for Worst Picture and Worst Remake. And then, in subsequent years, The Haunting largely became a forgotten movie. No one was really talking about it anymore, it just came and went. So where did it all go wrong? Well, my theory is, maybe people were confused with what to expect. I mean, you look at the poster, and you think that you're going to get The Exorcist, or something of that ilk, but what you get is more of a special effects-ridden roller coaster ride, so it's less Exorcist and more Star Wars. Aesthetically speaking, the movie has a look and feel of a creepy, dark, gothic horror movie. But then it also has loud, bombastic moments filled with CGI. That feels like it's trying to be more of an as-mentioned popcorn roller coaster ride movie. That's designed to give you a quick thrill, rather than being genuinely scary. Something I've noticed that happened quite a few times while researching the movie, and something you guys have no doubt heard me mention several times, is people leaving the production due to creative differences. One of them being Stephen King himself, with even Yann de Bont having a clash of visions, which in turn caused the reshoots. Maybe there was just an overall clash over the movie's ideology, with people who wanted to make it an unnerving ghost story, and Spielberg who wanted to make it more of a special effects crowd pleaser. And I guess you can't blame him, as it worked for Poltergeist, along with other scare movies that he had made, like Jaws and Jurassic Park. So he was just going with what has worked with his movies in the past. But these clashes of dark gothic supernatural thriller mixed in with a Hollywood style of special effects and set pieces do clash. And maybe at its core, that is the big issue with The Haunting. I also do think that the CGI does hurt the movie, as it does really look animated in places. But at that time, Industrial Light and Magic, who are working on the effects, were also working on The Phantom Menace. So maybe most of their care and attention went into that movie, but that's just a guess. 
But all said and done, I don't think The Haunting is a terrible movie, and I don't think it deserved all the backlash it got. And something I've noticed is that in recent years, the movie seems to have made a resurgence. A new fan base who have gone back to rewatch it and come to the conclusion that it's actually a pretty enjoyable movie. In the past, I haven't said the nicest things about this movie, but upon going back to rewatch it recently, my opinion of it has gone up. Just go into it not expecting the ultimate horror ghost movie experience that's going to push boundaries, but rather as a fun popcorn movie. A B movie in disguise as a serious gothic supernatural drama. And once you get past all that, you'll probably see that The Haunting is a good time. So that was my look into The Haunting. It's a fun movie. Think of it as being like a watered down version of 13 Ghosts or Ghost Ship. And if you can get that in your mindset, then you'll probably see that it still has a lot of enjoyability. Anyway, I'm Minty, and I don't know if ghosts are real or not, but they sure do scare the piss out of me. See ya!